<laughs> okay, so good evening, everyone. My name is Dr. Megan Williams. I use she, her pronouns, and I am assistant director of the Emily Taylor Center for Women and Gender Equity at the University of Kansas. And I'm thrilled to welcome everyone to tonight's event featuring Dr. Kristen R. Godsey, speaking on the history of International Women's Day in honor of Women's History Month and IWD, which was observed yesterday. Before I introduce our guest speaker, I'd like to thank the KU Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies for their generous co-sponsorship of this event. I would also like to thank KU Students United for Reproductive and Gender Equity and KU International Women's Association for raffling off five copies of Dr. Gotzi's acclaimed book, Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism and Other Arguments for Economic Independence. Raffle winners will be selected from tonight's list of attendees and notified uh, following the event. Please note that we are formatting this Zoom meeting to simulate a webinar, so we've turned off mic access for attendees and ask that you please submit your questions for our speaker to me um, via the chat function. And so I will relay those to Kristen and then um, have her answer those. Uh, we are recording this event and it will be archived to the Emily Taylor Center's YouTube channel and I'll be sending up a follow-up email with a link to this event. Um, and now it's my absolute pleasure to introduce Dr. Kristen R. Godsey. Um, I've been a fan of her work for a while now and I was thankful that the director of the center, Bulang Ramiz Hall, was very supportive of bringing here bringing her here <laughs> to get you to speak. Um, so now about uh, Dr. Godsey. Uh, Dr. Godsey is a professor of Russian and East European studies and a member of the graduate group in anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. Her articles and essays have been translated into over 20 languages and have appeared in publications such as The New Republic, The Lancet, Ms. Magazine, The Washington Post, and The New York Times. She is also the author of nine books, most recently, Second World, Second Sex, Socialist Women's Activism and Global Solidarity During the Cold War, and Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism, which has already had 13 international editions. Her latest book is Taking Stock of the Shock, Social Impacts of Transition in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, co-authored with Mitchell A. Orenstein and forthcoming with Oxford University Press. She was also awarded a John Simon Guggenheim, Guggenheim Fellowship for her work in anthropology and cultural studies. In addition, she is the host of AK-47, a podcast that I highly recommend based on the works of socialist women's activist, Alexandra Kolontoy. And so if you would all join me in a virtual round of applause to welcome Dr. Gatsi. Yay. Thank you so much. So, okay, I'm gonna close the window uh, and hand over the admitting duties to you. Thank you. And uh, I wanna thank you very much for the very generous introduction and for the invitation. I, you know, in, in a better year, I would have been out there in Lawrence, yeah. but um, this year uh, we're doing this this way. So. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right in, and I really encourage uh, the participants there to um, please throw your questions, comments, thoughts in the chat box. Um, I obviously won't see them while I'm speaking, but when uh, we are done, when I'm done giving my presentation, I will have plenty of opportunity to you know, hopefully we'll have plenty of opportunity to take questions and, and comments and thoughts. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, here we go. Let's see, share. I hope everybody can see this. I'm going to go into presentation mode. There we are. All right. So I'm uh, going to be speaking today about the socialist history of International Women's Day, which was yesterday. And um, I am going to start this talk with, you know, a, a few reflections on the ways in which International Women's Day has been increasingly co-opted and corporatized by American um, uh, companies. 
And um, so here there is a website called Promotion Ideas. I think it's Easy Promos. And this is a website where businesses can go to get ideas for running promotions for their businesses, you know, special deals for special days. And so yesterday was a day where a lot of companies decided that they were going to do certain kinds of promotion in order to celebrate women. And, you know, not surprisingly in the United States, this often holidays like this generally tend to have a pretty commercial aspect to them. So this was uh, from 2019 and it was a, a Women's Wear Daily article about how different fashion and beauty brands were celebrating International Women's Day. And of course, the idea is that you use women's empowerment as a way to sell people cosmetics and, and clothes. Uh, Google, for the last couple of years, has done the Google Doodle um, around International Women's Day. Um, this is the one from last year. I didn't actually screenshot the one from yesterday, which was interesting. Um, but, what's, but what's really fun about some of these promotions are brands who decide to use International Women's Day as a way for one day a year to sort of change something about the representation of their brand. So here you can see um, brawny paper towels, which as I'm sure you know, usually has like a lumberjack kind of guy on it in this uh, plaid um, red flannel shirt. And um, strength has no gender was the uh, rebranding for International Women's Day with three women on the brawny paper towels. Another really fun one from 2018 was that um, Kentucky Fried Chicken decided to introduce Colonel Sanders' wife. Uh, her name was uh, um, Claudia Sanders. Um, and and this, was, this was their way of celebrating uh, International Women's Day was introducing uh, the wife of Colonel Sanders. Um, quite, uh, controversially in 2018, McDonald's also decided for one day uh, to turn the golden arches upside down to make a W, um, proudly celebrating, uh, you know, Women's Day. You know, of course, you know, we could say all sorts of things about celebrating women when McDonald's pays way below um, living wages, but 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 for one day, they turned their sign upside down and celebrated women. And not to be outdone yesterday, because, you know, McDonald's got a lot of publicity, lots of clicks on this, because people, of course, were making fun of McDonald's. Burger King decided to do the same thing yesterday. And this is a series of tweets that got Burger King into a whole bunch of trouble yesterday, um, the first of which was women belong in the kitchen. Uh, and then they said, if they want to, of course. Um, yet only 20% of chefs are women, and we're on a mission to change the gender ratio in the restaurant industry by empowering female employees with the opportunity to pursue a culinary career. Hashtag IWD, you know, uh, female sign. Um, and they are um, proud to be launching a new scholarship program, which will help female Burger King employees pursue their culinary dreams. Now, again, you know, the irony of places like Kentucky Fried Chicken and McDonald's and uh, Burger King, which do not pay any of their employees, let alone their female employees, uh, a living wage. Um, the idea of like launching a scholarship, and of course there are very few details here about what this, is it one employee, is it two, is it three, who knows? But it's a publicity stunt. And uh, you can see from the, the, the retweet rates that it was a very popular publicity stunt. So it's turned into, International Women's Day has turned into a way that corporations can kind of commodify a particular sort of girl boss, you go girl feminism, uh, without linking it to, ironically, the really deep socialist roots of the holiday. So what I'm going to do in this talk over the next 40 minutes or so is I'm going to try to tell you a little bit about the socialist roots of International Women's Day and more broadly, the link between the history of socialism and the history of women's emancipation and how that link between socialism and women's emancipation ends up putting important forms of pressure on Western countries. I'm going to specifically focus on the United States today and sort of catalyze the women's movement in our country. 
So one of the narratives that we hear in the United States often, I'm just gonna stop share for a second before I jump into my presentation. One of the narratives that we hear or we believe is that sort of women's rights were fought by American feminists out on the streets, you know, um, marching with their signs and burning their bras and doing all the things that feminists do when they're trying to call attention. And one of the things that I think is a, a part of the story that isn't often told is the role that the Cold War and particularly superpower rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union during the 20th century played in actually catalyzing women's rights around the globe. And so that's the story I'm gonna try to tell as I tell this longer history of International Women's Day and its socialist roots. So let's go back to the slideshow. So, when we talk about socialism, a lot of people want to root it uh, in Marx and Engels and um, obviously or in the experience of Eastern Europe in the 20th century with the Soviet Union. But in fact, socialist ideas or what were called at the time utopian socialist ideas go back much earlier to the early 1800s in the wake of the French Revolution. And particularly, they're associated with Henri Saint-Simon and Charles Fourier, who were two utopians, French utopian socialists uh, and also Swiss, um, who really believed that in order to create uh, more equitable societies, you needed to have women's emancipation. And um, many people credit Fourier with actually inventing the term, the word feminism, although there are some debates about that. But people like Flora Tristan, who was also, she was a French Peruvian, she also uh, wrote a very important book called The Workers' Union, where she imagined that the emancipation of the workers would never be complete without the concomitant emancipation of women. So that women and workers were natural, natural allies in the struggle for more equitable societies. Obviously, many of you have heard of Friedrich Engels. He wrote a very important book called On the Origin of the family, private property, and the state, where he also argued that women's emancipation was going to be a result of any sort of socialist revolutionary politics, and that socialist revolutionary politics would not be successful without the help of women workers in particular. But the person who's really important for the discussion that we're having today is a German gentleman called August Bebel. Now, Bebel, was one of the founders of the German Social Democratic Party, and he was in jail, he was imprisoned. There was a series of anti-socialist laws passed in Germany by Bismarck. And when Bebel was in prison, he wrote a really important book called Woman and Socialism. It was published in 1879, and uh, between 1879 and 1914, at the start of the First World War, Women in Socialism was published in over 50 editions and was translated into over 20 languages. So it was an extremely popular book in Europe at the time. The first English edition appears in 1908, and Bebel believed that women were the equals to men and should have the same economic, social, and political rights and duties. And this was a really kind of radical idea, obviously, in 1879. Here uh, you can see a, a Bulgarian edition of this book, a translation that I found in the Bulgarian National Library. Um, the publication date in the Bulgarian language was 1893, so very early, only four years after the original publication in Germany. You can see here two uh, translations, one in Spanish on the left, one in French on the right. These are around 1906, 1907 that these begin to appear. In this book, this is actually a picture of the copy that I have at my own house, um, was this, uh, this sentiment was there is no liberation of humanity without social independence and gender equality. So what did Babel want specifically? He had a, a pretty radical series of, 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 of suggestions for what socialism would allow women to achieve in a future. So obviously universal suffrage was one of the demands, not surprisingly, this was a demand of many social movements at that time. Uh, rights to education, rights to the professions, rights for married women's property, the right for women to initiate divorce, which was, again, uh, quite rare at that time, the right for women to dress as they wanted. There were sartorial, sartorial restrictions on women at the time. 
Um, right for women to have sex when they wanted, which was very scandalous at the time, and for the abolition of all calculation in marriage. Um, Bebel was a very progressive figure, and we don't know enough about him in this country, but he really starts the ball rolling in terms of socialist women's activism in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. He does this partially through his colleague, a woman named Clara Zetkin. She was the editor-in-chief of a working women's newspaper called Die Gleichheit. And this newspaper was essentially a newspaper responsible for radicalizing social women, uh, sorry, working women, bringing them to socialist ideas and really popularizing the works of people like August Babel and Flora Tristan and uh, Friedrich Engels. So um, one of the things that was really popular, because obviously before the internet and before Zoom and email, when you wanted to actually do political activist work, you had to have schools. And so this is Rosa Luxemburg, another really key figure at the time in the German Social Democratic Party. And this is a Social Democratic Party school in 1907 that was held in Stuttgart. And it was at, organ at, it was at classes and courses like this that were organized where these ideas about the importance of women's emancipation as a core principle of socialist ideology begin to be propagated. You can see Rosa Luxemburg here. This is uh, in 1907 as well at the first International Congress of Socialist Women in Stuttgart, Germany. Clara Zetkin and uh, Rosa Luxemburg were very good friends, and they believed that women workers were essential to the European socialist movement in whatever form it took. So at this time, there was not a big division between the Social Democrats and the more radical socialists. Um, but in both cases, they believed that women had to be part of any sort of emancipatory movement for workers in Europe. Now, we skip over the pond for uh, a, a bit here. And on March 8th in 1908, hundreds of women workers in New York, um, they, were, they were in the needle trades, demonstrated to form their own union and to demand the right to vote. And this demonstration led in 1909 to an uprising, it was called, of 30,000 women shirtwaist makers, which resulted in the first permanent trade unions for women's work, women workers in the United States. And at that time, we had a socialist party here. Um, Eugene Debs was uh, its head and the US Socialist Party formed a specific national women's committee, which called for the party to designate a day each year specifically to campaign for women's suffrage. And um, National Women's Day began in the United States in the Socialist Party here in 1909. Now, back over in Europe, the very next year, there was an International Congress of Socialist Women. This was the second one that happened in Copenhagen in 1910. And at this Congress, again, were Clara Zetkin, also a very important figure who I'm gonna talk about in a second, a woman named Alexandra Kolontai. And she was instrumental in convincing the delegates at this International Congress of Socialist Women to establish an International Women's Day. This is a picture of Kolontai. She's a very key figure because she was at this Congress in 1910, and later she becomes the first Soviet commissar of social welfare after the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917. So what's wonderful about this Congress is that we actually have Alexandra Kolontai's report of what happened uh, at the Congress and, and, and how International Women's Day gets established. She writes a great article in 1920, looking at the first 10 years of this holiday. So what she says was that initially the International Women's Day was to be on the 19th of March, uh, and it was celebrated for the first time in 1911, which makes um, yesterday the 110th anniversary of the holiday. And she says that our German uh, comrades picked the day because of its historic importance for the German proletariat. On the 19th of March, in the year of the 1848 revolution, the Prussian king recognized for the first time the strength of the armed people and gave way before the threat of a proletarian uprising. Among the many promises he made, which he later failed to keep, was the introduction of votes for women. The first International Women's Day took place in 1911. Its success succeeded all expectations. Germany and Austria on Working Women's Day was one seething, trembling sea of women. Meetings were organized everywhere, in the small towns and even in the village halls were packed so full that they had to ask male workers to give up their places for the women. 
Uh, so this popularity starts spreading across Europe. In Bulgaria, International Women's Day is formed uh, as an official holiday in 1915, partially as the result of reading groups like this one that I'm showing you a picture of. This is a Marxist ladies women's uh, reading group uh, in 1912. You can see that these um, women here have uh, decided to take a portrait together with their books um, around a, a portrait of Karl Marx. And, uh, and not surprisingly, um, we have the establishment of International Women's Day in 1915 in countries like Bulgaria. And across Europe, you have the establishment of this holiday by socialist women and communist women. The date was permanently moved to March 8th in 1913. And um, let's see, whoops, go back. So Women's Day during the First World War obviously met with some challenges because women weren't allowed to travel to other countries as easily because of the war. Um, but it became a very important day to protest the war. So many women during uh, this period of time were also pacifists, as were many socialists and communists. And so the pacifist movement overlapped with the women's movement. And you can see here, this German poster says, against the imperialist war. But the real moment that International Women's Day becomes significant for history, and one of the reasons why we didn't celebrate it in the United States for a very long time, was because of a, of a strange trick of calendars. So on March 8th, 1917, which by the old Julian calendar in Tsarist Russia is actually February 23rd, Russian women marched through the streets of St. Petersburg demanding bread and peace. And these events led to the abdication of the Tsar four days later, beginning the Russian Revolution. So we often refer to this as the February Revolution because it happened in February on the Julian calendar. But in Western Europe, the day would have been March 8th. And it's very important when you look at pictures of these demonstrations, it's very clear that it's women who are out there in the streets. You can see an image here. Uh, this is a rough translation. If a woman is a slave, there won't be freedom. You know, long live the equally righted, or equal righted women, woman. All right, so in the Soviet Union, uh, March 8th becomes an official holiday in 1919, uh, again, in the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution. And initially it's called the International Day of Working Women. Um, and then it gets changed to International Women's Day in the 20s. And um, in 1965, the Soviet Presidium decides to make International Women's Day a paid holiday off work. Um, and, and there's a funny kind of story about this because in the Soviet Union, there are very mixed feelings about this holiday because it was a, was a great holiday for a while. And, and some women complain that after 1975, sorry, 1965, when it was made a paid holiday off work, men just used it as an excuse to go out and get really drunk. And it actually ended up creating more work for women rather than being a celebration of them. So it has a, a an interesting history in the Soviet Union. But nevertheless, it was celebrated every year and it was uh, widely disseminated as a holiday to all of the countries that fall into the Soviet sphere of influence after the Second World War and certainly during the 60s and 70s and 80s during the period of decolonization in the developing world, in what we call the Global South. So here, uh, quickly, we talk about World War II. And this is just sort of a little interesting aside to sort of, to sort of give you a sense of women's emancipation as a project in the Soviet Union and the ways in which women's rights get coded as communist in the United States, okay? So, Without going into a whole bunch of detail, women are mobilized into the labor force in the Soviet Union throughout the 20s. They start to receive military training in the 30s. Uh, women's, women have opportunity for uh, education and uh, advancement into previously male professions all throughout this early period of time. I was on an event the other day with a Russian woman whose grandmother earned a PhD in physics in 1949 in the Soviet Union. So Soviet women were really well integrated into the labor force by the Second World War. And one of the things that we know about in the United States, for instance, is that like Rosie the Riveter, right? When the men went off to war, a lot of women in the United States went into the factories. But in the Soviet Union, what we don't realize is that there were many women who were actually in the Soviet military and many of them saw frontline combat. 
So I'm going to give you the example of a very famous uh, sniper named Ludmila Pavlichenko. She had confirmed 309 Nazi kills between 1941 and 1942. And what's so interesting about Pavlichenka is that she came to the United States in 1942 and she toured around our country in order to kind of drum up support for the American entry into World War II. And the American media did not know what to do with this woman. So she was a cold-blooded killer. She was a sniper who had killed many Nazis. And yet she was also a very charming young woman. She was like 26 years old at the time. And she was uh, very charismatic. And so I'm going to read you a kind of a, a couple of media reports about how she was treated in the United States. When the New York Times reported that Pavlichenko wore no lip rouge or makeup of any kind, a female journalist felt compelled to ask her whether girls fighting in Russia were allowed to wear makeup at the front. Now, remember, this is the Second World War, okay? Um, Ludmilla simply replied, there's no rule against it, but who has time to think of her shiny nose when there's a battle going on? Um, Writing in the Features for Modern Women section of the Philadelphia Inquirer, a journalist uh, enthused over Pavlichenka's appearance, and this is a quote, men wanted to meet her, this attractive 26-year-old Kiev University student who set out to be a history scholar and has now become a modern military legend. Men in uniform accepted her. Girls crowded around her too. One wanted to know, how does she keep that beautiful complexion? Ludmilla, has that rosy cheeked, healthy look that mothers claim carrot eating will give. I, I didn't know that. Uh, one slim co-ed said, I wish she would take me back to Russia and teach me to be a sniper. And um, this is a wonderful transcript from a press conference that Pavlichenko gave when she was in the United States. This is included in her memoir, which is called, interestingly, Lady Death. Uh, a question from a woman journalist, is that your parade uniform or your everyday uniform? And she says, we have no time for parades at the moment. Uh, and then another question comes, but that uniform makes you look fat or don't you mind? To which Pavlichenko replies, I am proud to wear the uniform of the legendary Red Army. It has been sanctified by the blood of my comrades who have fallen in combat with the fascists. It bears the order of Lenin, an award for military distinction. I wish you could experience a bombing raid. Honestly, you would immediately forget about the cut of your outfit. And then another question comes, the tobacco company, Philip Morris, is offering you a contract. They are ready to pay half a million dollars to put your portrait on cigarette packets. Will you agree to it? No, they can go to the devil, is what she says. And so today on the internet, if you know anything about Pavlichenko, you will find all sorts of very funny memes celebrating her accomplishments, accomplishments as a sniper. But I think what's really interesting is that in the United States, people didn't really know how to deal with the fact that there was this very accomplished military woman who was also a woman and very visibly a woman. And they kept asking her questions about her underwear and her makeup and everything like that. And I think this is really important for something that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes. So as I'm sure you know, we were allied with the Soviet Union in the Second World War. And so in 1946, this is a, a, a newspaper article celebrating or uh, covering a tea, special tea that was held on International Women's Day of March 8th. 1946, given by the National Council of American and Soviet Friendship in honor of Soviet women at the Soviet consulate in New York. And you can see there are a list of women here who are in attendance. Uh, very importantly, this woman, Muriel Draper, is the chair of an organization that I'm going to talk about in a moment called the Congress of American Women. So I don't need to tell you that we went through uh, an incredible red scare in this country in the late 1940s and the early 1950s when uh, people were very paranoid about the spread of communism around the world, but also the infiltration of communists into the United States. And so this organization that I mentioned that Muriel Draper was involved with, as with uh, many women who were um, identified either as communists or socialists at this time, 
They are called up in front of the House Un-American Activities Committee, which investigates the Congress of American Women and determines that they're not really interested at all in women's rights, but instead it is a communist front organization. That the Soviets are basically using talk of equal rights for women, of women entering the professions and of women's education and women becoming military snipers as a way to drum up support for communism. And so uh, the CAW, this Congress of American Women, is forcibly disbanded. Um, and from that moment on in the late 1940s, women's rights are very much associated with communism and the spread of communism in the United States. So there's a really wonderful book. If you haven't read it, if you're interested in um, uh, our history, the history of American families during the Cold War, uh, Homeward Bound by Elaine Tyler May is a classic text. And what she basically says in this book is that traditional gender roles represent the American way of life for a very long time in our country, as probably best represented by the beloved sitcom, Leave it to Beaver, and the figure of, of June Cleaver, who is the, the stay at home mom, right? Who's often cooking in the kitchen and baking cookies and things like that. Um, but over in the Soviet Union, and then increasingly in places like now Red China after 1949, women's rights and women's international solidarity become a potent message of the Soviet Union's foreign policy. So this is a picture before the Sino-Soviet split. Uh, it says, our friendship is indestructible. This is a, showing a, a Russian woman, obviously a Soviet woman with a Chinese woman. And what I really think is interesting is the ways in which East-West competition over women's rights ends up fueling, right, uh, the women's movement here in our own country. And so I'm going to argue, and, and this is a bit controversial, I think, that without the Soviet Union and the Soviet attention to women's rights, and more broadly, the socialist world's attention to women's rights, we in the United States, and I would make this argument similarly for places like West Germany or the UK or France, would not have done as much to promote women into the professions, uh, into education and training as we otherwise would. And I now I'm going to substantiate that claim with a couple of concrete examples. So this is a US News and World Report magazine from March 1st, 1957. This is a very long expose on the true story of Russia's weakness. And um, one of the things that's so fascinating about this is that one of the claims that gets put forward in this magazine is that women are equal. They admit that women in the Soviet Union are equal, but this equality has made them unfeminine. And if you read some of the texts here, it says a woman's place in Russia, I know it's very small, is seldom in the home, okay? Um, women are out and actually doing things in the labor force. They're actually working, they're participating, they're actually sometimes doing quite hard labor. And of course, the Americans see this as a detriment to them because they don't have time to be pretty anymore because they don't have time to care about how they look. And here again, this is the same March 1st, 1957, why women lack feminine qualities. The long hours of work leave those not handicapped by heavy jobs, little time for grooming their feminine qualities, even if the incentive were there. Um, and so one of the things that's really interesting about this language, and I won't read it all, is that um, they really see women's emancipation as a problem. And here's a great representative quote, a woman must, the argument runs, be free to develop her own personality and to make maximum contribution to the progress of the communist community. She must therefore have coordinate status, which means equal status with men, and above all, be independent of the man who, for mutual convenience, happens to be her husband. To be dependent on her husband is to become his slave, forced to do his bidding and tied down to a dreary and fruitless life of keeping house and raising children. So this is how the Americans are portraying what's going on in the Soviet Union as completely horrific for our way of life in the United States. Because, you know, God forbid women want to be equal with their husbands. Uh, God forbid women want to do something more than keeping house and raise their children. But at the same moment in 1957, 
there is a report published by the National Manpower Council, and it's called Women Power. And in this report, the scholars that put the report together are very clearly starting to worry about the spread of communism. And they're also starting to worry about a pretty significant shortage of skilled personnel in the United States, particularly engineers, scientists, mathematicians, and other forms of technicians. So this is a quote from this 1957 Manpower Council report. The communist coup in Czechoslovakia in 1948 followed by the outbreak of uh, hostilities in Korea in 1950, were the major precipitants of other shortages of highly trained personnel. They're talking about in the United States. Recognizing that it was faced by a strong and ruthless opponent, i.e. communism, the United States acted to strengthen its defenses. So what they're talking about here is national security objectives. And um, what I think is really fascinating here is I'm going to read this rather long quote because I think it's very instructive, is the ways in which the United States government starts to get very nervous about the inclusion of Soviet women into these highly trained uh, professions, particularly engineers. National security objectives are, are also invoked in reaching judgment, judgments about shortage situations. Commonly used, a commonly used yardstick is the number of students who complete their education and training for scientific and professional occupations in the Soviet Union. Some who employ this measure visualize the United States as losing out in a race for highly trained manpower because about twice as many engineers are currently being graduated in Russia as in the United States. A doubling of the number of engineers graduated each year by American schools has even been urged in order to keep pace with the gains made by the Soviet Union. It is worth noting in this context that there are annually, this is 1957, mind you, some 13,000 women graduating as engineers in the Soviet Union compared to well under 100 in the United States. In the Soviet Union, moreover, women also make up a substantial majority of the new supply of physicians. So, at the same time that your US News and World Report is telling us that Soviet women who work are unfeminine, the government is starting to get really nervous about all of these female engineers who are presumably going to make the Soviet Union a much more productive and competitive country during the arms and space race. So I also just wanted to mention, this is a wonderful film if nobody's seen it. Um, it's called Jet Pilot starring John Wayne and Janet Leigh. Uh, it was started, the, the film, they started filming it in 1949, and it was released in 1957, the same year that all this is happening. And it stars not only these two well-known Hollywood actors, but also the U.S. Air Force actually gets a, a credit. Um, and it is a, a story of an American pilot and a Soviet female fighter pilot. Which, again, if you can imagine in 1957 in the United States, it's unthinkable for an American woman to be a fighter pilot. And so, of course, Janet Lee, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a typical sort of boy meets girl kind of thing. And of course, you know, Janet Lee can't resist the charms of John Wayne. But I think that it's really interesting if, you know, if I had more time, I could show you a clip from this. But I really encourage you to go out and, and find some clips on YouTube of the ways in which Janet Lee is portrayed as this emancipated Soviet woman, because it was a really, uh, it was unthinkable for an American woman to be in that same position. And she's actually quite glamorous and not unfeminine, right? As opposed to what the US News and World Report wants us to think. So of course, as you know, in 1957, the Soviet Union launches Sputnik in October uh, of that year. And the United States, freaks out because the Soviets have put a little beeping metal ball in satellite around the globe. And all of this anxiety about whether or not we have enough engineers to compete in the space race comes to the head. And so in 1958, the um, US government passes the, the, sorry, the National Defense Education Act. And this is an act that specifically earmarks money for the education of women and girls in math and science. Um, many of the kind of precursors of the sort of women in mathematics programs we have today actually kind of uh, stem from this 1958 piece of legislation. Similarly, with the establishment of the first Presidential Commission on the Status of Women in 1961 by President Kennedy, in the executive order that he signs to establish this commission, national defense 
is very specifically cited as a reason why the American government needs to pay some attention to women's rights. So at the same time around the globe, Women's Day remains as a holiday committed to the ideals of socialism and peace. And I think that it's really important. This is a poster you see here from 1961, which is just two years, the same year, sorry, that um, Kennedy signed this uh, presidential order. And then in 1963, the Soviets drop another bombshell on us. And that is that they launched the first woman into space, a woman named Valentina Tereshkova. Uh, this is the cover of the New York Her Herald Tribune, Soviet blonde orbiting as first woman in space. And this is the Springfield Union from Massachusetts, Soviet orbits its first cosmonaut. And I think that immediately after this, the uh, Soviets decide to start using Valentina Tereshkova as a symbol of women's emancipation. This is a, a March 8th poster as well from the Soviet Union. You could see here this broad coalition of international women with Tereshkova and her cosmonauts uniform uh, at the center here. So it becomes this incredible propaganda tool for the Soviet Union to be out there on the world stage saying that socialism is the only political and economic system that allows women equal rights. So in 1963, the same year that Tereshkova is launched into space, President Kennedy releases this report that says uh, from the first uh, Presidential Commission on the Status of Women, which by the way was chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt, which is interesting. Um, I think we ought to look, Kennedy wrote, as a society at what our women are doing and the opportunities before them. Other societies, which we do not admire as much as our own, it seems to me, have given this problem their particular attention. And clearly he's talking here about the Soviet Union and its allies in Eastern Europe. And I think it's interesting that in 1963, we also see the, publish, uh, the, the publication of The Feminine Mystique, which is Betty Friedan's famous book, um, which many people say is the beginning of the women's rights movement in the United States. But as you can see, Behind the scenes within the government, there are all sorts of conversations already going on about whether or not the United States should be trading women. So this is an, a lovely stamp from, again, um, Russia, from, uh, from the Soviet Union in 1967, celebrating International Women's Day. And International Women's Day also becomes a really important part of Soviet foreign policy with regard to anti-colonial discourses and civil rights. This is a poster from Cuba, uh, March 8th poster from Cuba. This is another Soviet poster. Uh, if you're interested in the intersections between women's rights and uh, Soviet um, foreign policy and Eastern Bloc foreign policy, actually very specifically, I look at Bulgaria and Zambia in this book, Second World, Second Sex, uh, global women's activism and global solidarity during the Cold War. I I uh, highly um, suggest you do that because I can't I can't cover all of that information in this talk. So um, I'm going to give you one last example of the kind of Cold War competition, and that is Soviet women in um, athletics at the Olympics. So the United States was getting its butt kicked in the uh, Olympic medal count, and it turned out that it was largely because Soviet women were really excellent athletes. And so as a result of this, we also passed a piece of legislation, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, called Title IX. And Title IX uh, allowed for certain kinds of federal funding for um, women's um, participation in sports. So... All of this is going on in that same year, 1972, an umbrella organization called the Women's International Democratic Federation, which was based in East Berlin. It was a, um, a kind of global left coalition of socialist, communist, and other sorts of perfect progressive women, proposes to the UN that they have an International Women's Year. And 1975 is officially declared International Year of the Woman. And it is in the International Year of the Woman that March 8th, this holiday that I've been talking about, becomes officially adopted by the United Nations as a global holiday called International Women's Day. At the same time, as I've argued, socialist attention to women's issues begins to really fuel the US women's rights movement. Again, a couple of book recommendations for more details. 
Kate Wigand's Red Feminism is a wonderful documentation of sort of leftist influences within the US women's movement. And Eric McDuffie's Sojourning for Freedom is a fantastic study of African American and Black feminists who were previously members of the CPUSA or had radical left um, backgrounds. So until the end of the Cold War, IWD was largely associated with the socialist bloc countries. And by the late socialist period, International Women's Day was hated in some countries, as I said, in the Soviet Union, and to a certain extent in Czechoslovakia, it was not very liked, but beloved in others. This is actually a, a very um, funny Bulgarian postcard for that I was somebody sent me yesterday for International Women's Day. Um, it's a very popular holiday in places like Bulgaria and Poland. And so it really depends on where you are and who you are. Uh, some former Soviet citizens still like the holiday. Others say that it was just a kind of a, you know, meaningless uh, holiday for that didn't really reflect uh, true respect for women. But as I'm sure you know, in 1989, the Berlin Wall falls. And in 1994, Representative Maxine Waters, a Democrat from California, tried to introduce legislation to make International Women's Day a holiday in this country. It never even made it out of committee. All right. So, um, but today, more than 25 countries still mark International Women's Day as an official holiday. It's an unofficial holiday in about a dozen more. A very diverse group of countries celebrate this holiday from Brazil to Afghanistan to Nepal. And in some countries, women get uh, gifts and flowers. In other countries, there are parades and big protests. This is uh, International Women's Day in France. This is International Women's Day in Israel. You can see this is Kenya, this is Argentina, this is Indonesia. This is a wonderful aerial shot of Montevideo in Uruguay. Uh, this was just last year. It was a women's strike parade. Um, this is Italy. Um, but what we get in the United States is a very different version of International Women's Day. Uh, we get a sticker. This was a wonderful piece that was uh, published in the New York Times two years ago. Happy International Women's Day, have a sticker. Um, and you can see uh, she's making reference here to the, the golden arches um, upside down as a woman, a, uh, as a W uh, for women. Um, and the idea of course is that um, it has completely been stripped of all of its radical history. Uh, so Baskin Robbins, uh, buy one, get one free for International Women's Day. You have cha time, you get 50% off uh, for all women nationwide. Um, Clinique, the cosmetics company, was giving away a lipstick. Uh, magazines were talking about various deals and specials that you could have. The Sims had a 20% off uh, coupon a couple of years ago for International Women's Day. And this is my favorite one. This is Michelin Tires had a special for International Women's Day as well. And I think most interestingly was also last night, um, Hillary Clinton and Nancy Pelosi had a special International Women's Day fundraiser um, for, and this is really quite uh, interesting, if you read the very small print here, it says to help elect women candidates and other Democrats. So um, again, the sort of co-optation, total erasure of the socialist um, history of this wonderful holiday that goes back to 1910. So we should not forget its socialist roots. Um, or the importance of socialist ideals in catalyzing attention to women's rights, not only in the United States, but as I have argued elsewhere, all around the world. So thank you so much for your attention, and I am happy to take questions and um, comments now in the chat. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, I already have a couple of questions for you. So I'll start with this one. Okay. Um, what are your thoughts on the political project of reclaiming materialist feminism? It seems that a large percentage of feminist discourse today tends to focus on cultural ideas about women and femininity, while discussion about the material basis of women's oppression such as the wage system and reproductive labor is often ignored. Is it important for us to make our feminism based in materialism today um, as it was 
is it as important for us to make our feminism based in materialism today as it was for the socialist women referenced in your presentation? I mean, you know, obviously I think my answer has to be yes, right? So, you know, one of the things that happened yesterday, for instance, was Kirsten Cinema tweeted out like International Women's Day greetings and thanks to all the wonderful women in her life and in, in law or whatever that supported her. And yet she very demonstrably voted down a $15 minimum wage, right? Mm -hmm. So if you really respect women, I mean, so many women in this country are minimum wage workers. And so the kind of, unfortunately, the kind of feminism that we have in the United States that has become very dominant is this sort of like, let's just, it's sort of a representational recognition based mm -hmm. feminism. Let's have a female vice president. Let's have more women in corporate boards, more women on the Supreme Court or more women, you know, doing um, various professions. So, so the Google doodle yesterday actually was a little video of, of women in sort of high prestige, mostly white collar professions. Mm -hmm. And it didn't celebrate, you know, women who are like waitresses or nurses mm -hmm. or teachers or, or all the things that so many women do. And I think that, look, the history of International Women's Day is a history of working women and of, of building better societies with more robust social safety nets for everybody, men included, by the way, right? I think that materialist feminists are also tend to be much more, um, you know, uh, willing to coordinate and cooperate with labor unions and other forms of, of, of social movements rather than just focusing specifically on gender issues. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely um, come from a place of saying that we, you know, the recognition part is, is fine, right? I'm not saying that we shouldn't have women on corporate boards or we shouldn't have mm -hmm. a woman president. I mean, it's just, that's not enough, mm -hmm. right? Having a few women at the very top, having a few sort of figures, I mean, it's important. Role models are important, but but we really need to think in a, in a real, you know, material way, like how are we living? How are we supporting mothers? How are mm -hmm. we supporting children? How are we supporting our, our, our minimum wage workers? How are we supporting our nurses and teachers, mm -hmm. all these grocery store workers, pharmacists, people who are on the front lines, mm -hmm. holding our society together during this pandemic. And yet, you know, we, we, we are constantly giving them really the short end of the stick. And so, the, the irony of like greeting out, you know, shouting out for women on Women's Day when you've just voted against something mm -hmm. that would be so incredibly beneficial to women in your country. Mm -hmm. It, you know, I, I think that those two things are just completely orthogonal and we should really fight against this narrow focus on sort of Sheryl Sandberg, lean mm -hmm. in, work harder kind of feminism. Let's go out and slay the boardroom, right? Mm -hmm. We really need to be thinking about building broad coalitions to expand the social safety net so that we have a more just and equitable society for everybody, not mm -hmm. just for a few women at the top. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. I definitely agree with you on that. Um, and really appreciated the fact that you started off with um, you know, focusing on how it's changed in the United States, right? And the focus is so much on celebrate individual women and like you said, wimps, girl bosses and, and things like that, um, which is one of the main reasons I asked you to join us um, because <laughs> I find that frustrating. <laughs> yeah. Um, so let's see, we have uh, another question. Uh, what does Dr. Godsey believe needs to be done to fight the commercialization of feminism and the capitalist spin on feminism? Yeah, so, um, you know, I have a colleague, Nancy Frazier at the New School who has written a really important article called um, uh, Feminism, Neoliberalism and the Cunning of Capitalism. I can't remember exactly what the title is, but she talks a lot about the ways in which neoliberal capitalism is very, very good at co-opting feminist mm -hmm. uh, concerns and sort of defanging them, right? So that they become much more about representation and far less about redistribution. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what I would say, I mean, it's not easy, right? You know, this happened to Mother's Day, right? In the United States, Mother's Day was kind of a radical pacifist holiday. Mm -hmm. and, um, and eventually it just became this sort of hallmark holiday where we, you know, just buy flowers or whatever. We completely lost the, the history of that holiday. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally you'll see a piece about it on Mother's mm -hmm. Day where people say, hey, remember that this, um, that this was a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. So, and, and I think that it's really important, education, right? I, I spend a lot of time thinking about that 1907 party school and that, mm -hmm. you know, 
Bulgarian ladies Marxist reading group from 1912, <laughs> where a bunch of people sort of get together around a text or, you know, and book clubs are kind of a thing, especially right now during the pandemic. I feel like um, we have lost a, a kind of um, appreciation for what I call, you know, autodidactism, right? The yeah. ability to educate ourselves in an informal way, the ability mm -hmm. to get together with a group of like-minded people and just sort of like talk about texts and read things together and discuss things together. We do it in universities. I mean, obviously I'm a, I'm a university professor, so I do that in a structured way. Mm -hmm. But I think that one of the most interesting and important things that we can do is to create um, sort of social nodes in our lives around ideas, mm. right? And not just like hashtag activism on Twitter or Instagram mm -hmm. or Bookstagram or whatever, right? But actual like sitting down with people and maybe watching a video together or reading mm -hmm. a book together, reading an article together. I mean, there's so many wonderful new publications coming out right now on the left that, you know, obviously there are the sort of old stalwarts like Descent um, and The Baffler and, you know, we've got Jacobin. There's a brand new materialist feminist magazine coming out. Uh, I think their first issue just dropped this month called Looks Magazine based on Rosa Luxemburg. I just uh, subscribed. <laughs> yes, yes, I know. It's, so have I, right? And so, I mean, so I think that there's, we're at a moment where we can, um, we can push back against the commercialization. We can push back against the kind of Sheryl Sandberg lean-in feminism. We can push back and say, okay, yeah, fine. Representation is important, but what we really need is to think about the ways in which women's emancipation, just like they did, right? Mm -hmm. Like Flora Tristan and August Bebel did in the 19th century, the way that that the issues of economic equality and um, and uh, and sustainability as well, right? Mm -hmm. We can bring the environmental concerns into this are deeply and profoundly linked with with um, women's emancipation, and to mm -hmm. see them all as interlinked and interconnected rather than independent movements which tend to sort of devolve into a kind of competitive victimhood in a commercial mm -hmm. economy. And I just think that that's a, we have to fight against that in every single way that we can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's see, we got some more messages. Hmm. Okay. So, all right, so we have a question here from the president of Students United for Reproductive and Gender Equity, who um, mm -hmm. helped us in co-sponsoring this. And so um, she is asking if you could just talk a little bit about abortion rights in the Soviet Union or in communist countries versus um, here. Yeah, mm -hmm. so um, that's a great topic. And um, I, you know, this is like an entire, a mm -hmm. lecture in one of my courses. <laughs> so so the, 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 there's a couple of key things that you need to know, right? So, so the Soviet Union is the first country in the world to legalize abortion in 1920. Uh, women could access abortion uh, pretty much almost on demand. Uh, Stalin reverses that policy in 1936, and it remains uh, illegal uh, for a long time until after his death, it's re-legalized in 1955. And, um, and after 1955, it's, it's so um, common that in fact, most Soviet women use it as a form of birth control, mm -hmm. which is not really an ideal circumstance, right? But mm -hmm. it is a completely normalized thing. So again, this colleague from Russia that I was on a talk with the other day mentioned something about how, you know, the average per capita Soviet abortion rate was about six or seven per woman, per woman over the course of mm -hmm. her reproductive lifetime. Mm -hmm. But it was so completely normalized that I had a student, you know, we were talking about this in one of my classes and she was really, so an American student was saying like, how mm -hmm. could you have six or seven abortions? Like, isn't it supposed to be bad for you? Mm -hmm. And this, you know, woman from a former Soviet country was like, well, I don't think so. And it's so normal. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you go, you know, girls go to um, the abortion clinic with their grandmothers, mm. right? <laughs> it's a, just mm -hmm. a, a very different way of thinking yeah. about, um, about reproductive rights. So that's the Soviet Union, which is a really interesting case. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, uh, and, and part of that was driven by an economy of shortage because they didn't have access to uh, birth control. Mm -hmm. In the Eastern Bloc countries, right? Abortion was extremely liberal with the exception of Romania after 1966 and Albania, which was very restrictive. And, and Romania after 1966 is one of the worst countries in the bloc to be a woman by far. Mm -hmm. Poland legalized abortion in 1955. 
Um, and they had widespread birth control, even though they were a Catholic country. And the thing that's so fascinating about Poland, if you're watching the news right now, is that it's only after 1990, when Poland becomes a democracy, that they outlaw abortion, right? So reproductive rights were completely protected in Poland prior to 1989. And it's only after the end of the socialist era that you have um, very strict, uh, very strict controls on access to abortion in Poland. Um, it was very, very uh, uh, liberal in places like Hungary and Czechoslovakia. Uh, the GDR, again, uh, was very early on in, um, in uh, allowing women reproductive freedoms. And the GDR also had widespread oral contraceptive usage, which was un uh, uncommon in the Eastern Bloc at the time. Um, they made them domestically. And so, you know, we have these sort of stereotypes about these countries, but in fact, in many ways uh, ar around issues of reproductive rights, they were far more progressive than we were at a much earlier stage. Um, in terms of things like sexology, they were also, some of these mm -hmm. countries were much more progressive than we were at an earlier stage. In terms mm -hmm. of the decriminalization of homosexuality, right, mm -hmm. which happens in 1917 in the Soviet Union and happens much earlier in Czechoslovakia and the GDR and in Poland, Again, there's much more acceptance around um, alternative sexualities in the Eastern Bloc than in the in the in the West. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So you know, this is some of these things I write about in my book. Um, but I can also give uh, if people are interested. There's a I have a, a colleague uh, Agnieszka Kosianska who just wrote a wonderful book that came out with IU Press, I think a month ago, called mm -hmm. Gender and Pleasure and Violence, and it's all about um, sexology in Poland. And another colleague of mine. Katarzyna Liszkova, who wrote a book called Sexual Revolution Socialist Style, um, <laughs> which is about uh, sexology and reproductive rights in Czechoslovakia. Great. Um, I have sort of a, a question that dovetails off that. Um, mm -hmm. So they're asking about sort of how does that access to abortion fit into the argument you're making about Cold War competition catalyzing women's rights in the U.S.? Yeah, so so the thing about it is that in the it, it, it's the the U.S. was is a weird case, right? Because we mm -hmm. were very, um, I mean, we were very uncomfortable with abortion for a long time, right? In this country, and um, and there was uh, there what there were women here who were able to say, look over there, they have these rights, right? Um, how could it be that women in a totalitarian, authoritarian, communist country have more rights than women in a democracy, mm. right? So there was pressure, certainly pressure, to sort of liberalize some of these things that women wanted. But the best example of this comes from Sweden, because we think of Sweden as being super, super liberal and progressive. And mm. I found this great article where um, there, so it, abortion was illegal in Sweden. And um, there, there was a, I think this was like in the late 60s, there was this conference where several women went uh, on stage. They were like, they were abortion rights activists and they got up on stage and one of them was forced to have, you know, forced to have the child. And then uh, another one had traveled to Poland, communist Poland to get an mm. abortion. And so in the wake of this conference, I think, which was reported on television or reported somewhere in the Swedish media, there was suddenly a stampede of Swedish women going to Poland to get abortions. Wow. And, the, and the Swedish government suddenly realized that it looked really bad, that yeah. liberal Sweden, right, was withholding from women, uh, women a right that they really wanted and mm -hmm. that they had to travel to communist Poland mm -hmm. to get it. And so in the wake of this sort of, it's called the Polish scandal, um, mm -hmm. Sweden liberalizes its abortion law. So that's like a perfect example. Another great example of this is um, Western East Germany, right? The, the West German abortion law was way more restrictive than the East German one. And so when the two Germanys reunified in 1990, the entire reunification process almost fell down over this issue of reproductive oh, wow. rights. So, you know, so it, this Cold War competition is really important. Um, I don't yet have like the document that I want um, to, 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 to say, look, here's what was going on, for instance, in the, the minds of the Supreme Court during Roe. But, but mm -hmm. I do think that, that the context of the Cold War is incredibly important because mm -hmm. any time there was a right that women had in socialist countries that women didn't have in the United States, American women could say like, hey, yo, right? Mm -hmm. How could mm -hmm. you not be giving us 
these rights when you say that we're a democracy and we celebrate freedom and they're a evil communist regime that oppresses people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I am really interested in your argument and it makes total sense to me. Um, and it's interesting as someone who, you know, studied women's history and also black history, um, you know, that's discussed a lot in terms of the civil rights movement, right? Yeah. Is, um, the way that the Soviet um, and uh, communist nations, yeah, uh, pressured the United States into being more racially equitable. Um, yeah, and I'm just wondering, like, why do you think it's taken so long for that to become part of the narrative? Because you're, like you're saying, it's, it's controversial, right? To me, it seems to make complete sense. Um, yeah, I don't know what, if you have thoughts on that. Well, you know, so Mary Dedziak wrote that book, Cold yeah. War Civil Rights, right? That's the mm -hmm. book that you're referring to. And it's a wonderful book. And, um, you know, she did a reissue of that book with a new preface. And one of the things that she says in her preface is that when she started, you know, doing that research, she would talk to a lot of civil rights activists in the United States who felt that she had sort of taken something away from them. Mm. Right. That they they really felt like they had, you know, put their bodies on the line, gone out into the streets, you know, done the jail time, done all of the mm -hmm. activism. And they didn't really want to hear mm -hmm. that um, actually the reason that the government, you know, agreed to give you some civil rights, you know, little bits of them is because it mm -hmm. looked bad for them on the international stage when they had to go, you know, uh, to the UN and face the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a kind of political, there's a kind of, a, um, you know, optics is the word mm -hmm. I would say. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, and I've had that same experience when I do versions of this talk, for instance, especially older American feminists from the second wave, I do mm -hmm. feel like they're saying, but wait, you know, mm -hmm. but we did all these really important things. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that those two narratives are mutually exclusive. No, I think they yeah. can exist side by side. But I think it's just taken time. And then mm -hmm. the other thing that I will say, and I think this is really important, mm -hmm. is that, you know, until the last year or two, now I've been doing research on women's rights in the Eastern Bloc for about 25 years, okay? Mm -hmm. um, so, so this has been a long uh, a project and a big uphill battle for me because until about two years ago, it was really hard to say anything positive about the former socialist countries in yeah. the Eastern Bloc, right? Mm -hmm. And people, you know, I faced a lot of resistance in my research over the course of my career. It's only suddenly, right? Mm -hmm. I think because of maybe Bernie Sanders, maybe because of mm -hmm. Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez, I don't know why, mm -hmm. but suddenly mm -hmm. people are like interested, right? Yeah. In a way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, and maybe it's just far enough in the past now, it's 30 years, and, mm -hmm. and now we can sort of take a little bit of distance from it and say, mm -hmm. okay, maybe it wasn't as you know, it wasn't some big, long, gray, totalitarian hellscape of gulags and purges and famines as we all think it was, right? Maybe mm -hmm. but people had babies and people went mm -hmm. to school and people got PhDs and started families and fell in love. It's like, it's just a world like anybody else's world. Mm -hmm. So I think that's part of it, right? Is that yeah. it's partially a domestic resistance and then also yes. mm -hmm. a kind of narrative uh, refusal to mm -hmm. look back. Uh, because of course, you know, the the obvious critique that I get mm -hmm. is, well, who cares if women had more rights in the Soviet Union? It was a terrible society, <laughs> right? So what, who cares? Mm -hmm. Like that's irrelevant, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's the that's the claim. Um, mm -hmm. And I think you know, again, it's an interesting claim, but you could say that just about anything, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, to me, right it now, seems like a both and type of, type of situation, you know, um, and. Um, and another sort of interesting piece is you mentioned that Red Feminism's book, and I had read that kind of recently, and I've been studying this uh, women's history for quite a long time as well, and um, and just found it so important um, to mention the way that the Red Scare really just like decimated a whole whole generation of um, of feminists who were doing yeah. work, yeah. Um, and and their papers, right? So Gerda Lerner talks about burning all of her papers. So oh, so there's oh, also a structural wow. problem, right? Is that women who were targeted by either the House on American Activities Committee or later McCarthy, mm -hmm. um, you know, if you know, some of them 
died, you know, so yeah. people didn't survive. Um, but, mm -hmm. but those who did were so paranoid and terrified that mm -hmm. they took all of their archives. And, you know, for, for somebody who does uh, this kind of women's history, it's horrifying. Mm -hmm. And they just torched them. Right. Mm -hmm. So the, the kind of documentation that we need to sort of substantiate some of these claims. Right. It's gone. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that's that's just really heartbreaking. Right. So yeah. even like, you know, even the sort of real kind of uh, social history, like people's journals and, and people's mm -hmm. letters, everything was burned because mm -hmm. they didn't want to be incriminated. Right. As yeah. communists. Mm -hmm. And so that makes it very, very difficult, I think, to do yeah. to do this kind of work. And it, you know, it means that you're constantly sort of you're fighting an uphill battle for the narrative, you're fighting an uphill battle for the sources, you're fighting an uphill battle for the resources, you're fighting an uphill battle for the audience. So, mm -hmm. so you're constantly having to like just keep going. And that's where mm -hmm. I think that these cultures of autodidactism and community mm -hmm. are really important, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, certainly. Um, so I have someone here who is asking if you could explain a little bit more on why you think the name was changed from Working Women's Day to just Women's Day. Um, and they're saying that in China, working is still kept in the translation. Oh, that's interesting. So, yeah, and it is an official holiday there. It is an official holiday, yeah. Um, you know, that, you know, that's a good question. It was changed in the twenties in the Soviet union. And I, I don't actually, I, I can speculate mm -hmm. that, um, it was an attempt to bring in, um, peasant women perhaps, mm -hmm. right? Because, uh, working women may have a particular kind of industrial oh, sound yeah. to it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so because peasant women are so important in, in Russia, especially, mm -hmm. I think that, um, that it may have to do with that. But I also think that it's because, you know, also there were, you know, so sort of socialist women's activists like Alexander Kolontai and Clara Zetkin mm -hmm. spent a lot of time criticizing bourgeois feminists. Right. They did not like bourgeois feminism, right. what we call liberal feminism. Yeah. But I think mm -hmm. at a certain point, there was also a strategic decision that was made to reach out and try to bring those women into mm -hmm. the movement. Mm -hmm. And so Working Women's Day would be very alienating for wealthier, pro more professional women mm -hmm. who might otherwise actually be on board with the pacifist message, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Or be on board with the creation of kindergartens and creches mm -hmm. and public mm -hmm. and cafeterias. Um, but but working women, you know, so so there's an interesting sort of sense of politics. And I think that because Colin Tai always sort of, you know, she after she leaves the Soviet Union, she spends many years working as a diplomat abroad in, in Norway uh, and in Mexico City, and eventually she's in Sweden. And she has a long diplomatic career. And so she interfaces a lot with Western women. And I think, I'm guessing that International Women's Day is just sort of more of an inclusive mm -hmm. term. Mm -hmm. um, but that it is fascinating that Working Women's Day is, is still kept in, in China. That's fantastic. Okay, let me see. Um, so we have questions about um, like sex education from mm -hmm. girls and young women and whether countries where abortion was so normalized also had um, better sex education. Yeah, again, so one of the things that I, I always have to say is you can't generalize, generalize. about the block, right? So, mm -hmm. so um, sex education in the Soviet Union, in Romania, in Albania, terrible, right? Sex education in Poland, Catholic Poland, in the GDR, in Czechoslovakia, in Hungary and Yugoslavia, fantastic, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, so my colleague Agnieszka Kosianska, I just mentioned her earlier about this book that came out um, about Polish sexology with Indiana University Press. She actually talks about a handbook that was uh, printed and made available to all Polish 15 year olds. This was oh, wow. a very progressive handbook that talked about pleasure, contraception. I mean, this is in Catholic poll. It's really remarkable. And mm. it, the Catholic church has to go in and get this book out of the schools in 1987, because it's so progressive, right? That they oh, don't wow. want these children to have this information. In Bulgaria, um, I can actually, I actually have it right here. Um, that there was this very famous book. Uh, oh, I thought I had it right here. Um, oh, it's right here. Here we go. 
Um, this is the this is the book that I was telling you about, my colleague's book from oh. IU Press. This book is um, is a very famous uh, uh, sex education book from a guy called Siegfried Schnabel. It was published in the GDR in 1969 and it went into multiple, multiple editions. It was also published in Bulgaria. And Bulgaria was very, you know, a little prudish around sex mm -hmm. education, but they decided to publish this book in Bulgarian, translate it and publish it into Bulgarian because they sort of felt that, you know, young people are gonna have sex. And it, actually there's a preface that says this. <laughs> And so if they're going to have sex, we should teach them to have good socialist sex, right? <laughs> <laughs> Rather than, you know, they're going to learn like deviant behaviors from Western mm -hmm. pornography or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and this is a really explicit book. I mean, there are instructions mm -hmm. in this book, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, so this is not just the kind of sex ed that we get in the United States, which is mm -hmm. like, don't get pregnant and don't get STDs, right? Yep. This mm -hmm. is like an instruction manual, right? Mm -hmm. How to do it. Yeah how to do it right, you know, um, and, and it's, it's just as concerned with male pleasure as it is with female pleasure. And so, and, and I think that this book, you know, it was translated into Spanish, it made its way to Cuba, uh, it made its way into Western Germany. Um, it was, you know, it was a very popular book. I think it, there were like 13 or 14 foreign editions of this book. It circulated very, very widely. It was one of the most, you know, most Bulgarians who grew up under socialism know this book very well. Um, <laughs> So, so in fact, you know, but, but then again, but then the Soviets, nah, not so much, right? Mm. They had really poor sex education. Um, and, and the Romanians had like zip, right? Um, mm. Because they didn't want people to use contraception after 66 mm. because they were trying to increase the birth rate. Population. So, you know, so the thing about these countries is that there were contradictions, right? On the one mm. hand, they really wanted women to have babies. They were very pro-natalist in the sense that they were mm. very pro-family, pro-motherhood, everything. But on the other hand, they also you know, to a greater or lesser extent, depending on where you were in the block, either made contraception freely available or they had free access to abortion. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, you know, I would say ideally, you know, you don't want to have six or seven abortions during your lifetime. Mm -hmm. So um, so contraception is a good thing, right? As is sex education. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's just, it's different in different places in the, in the block. But when we look at a place like Poland, like, or Czechoslovakia or the GDR. These are the three really, you know, best examples of extremely progressive sex education going back in Czechoslovakia to the 50s, which is shocking, right? Wow. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, they, they were way ahead of us in many mm. ways in terms of teaching people about like to, to enjoy human relationships. Yeah. Um, I think we have time for a couple more. Um, so I have someone here who is a Penn alum. Oh, and nice. And they said that they came uh, here because they enjoyed your discussion on Revolutionary Left Radio podcast. <laughs> oh, there's my cat. Um, <laughs> and so they say, I'm wondering how you think family structure should change or should change in a socialist utopia and what we have to Oops. Oh, now I lost it. Here. Oh, and what we have to do to get there. What historical public commons can we feasibly bring back today to redistribute the unpaid labor of women? Yeah. Okay. That's a great question. I'm thinking about this a lot right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, so one thing that I'm really interested in uh, is uh, in this anthropological concept of alloparenting. So um, I don't know if if uh, if any of you have godparents um, or if you grew up with um, your let's say maybe your mom had close female friends, mm -hmm. and so they these are these are people that are not kin relatives they're not your mm -hmm. family but they are other adults who are in your life right. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, in, in, in the Catholic religion, this is institutionalized in the, in the, in the form of the godparents, right? Um, but, but, but there are many societies, right, where, where children are raised by their biological parents and sort of a, a gaggle of what we call allo parents. So aunties mm -hmm. and uncles who are not really aunties and uncles, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that, so thinking about the commons, 
Um, there are two real key places that I think we can make very strategic interventions. So one of them is going to be, and we've already seen it starting to happen with the pandemic with potting, what they call mm. potting, right? Where parents, because schools are closed, they have to homeschool or there's no childcare. So a group of unrelated families get together and share childcare responsibilities with each other, or they, ch they share educational responsibilities with each other. And then children develop relationships with lots of different adults who are not necessarily their biological kin. And allo parenting, I mean, you know, obviously you have to be, th you know, you have to be thinking about the protection of the child and everything like that. But allo parenting is a wonderful institution, just having other adults in the life of children that are not mm -hmm. paid employees, right? But that are just right. like family friends um, that helps a lot to, to, to um, start to sort of begin to socialize. Like if we can't get to some sort of universal paid federally subsidized um, childcare, right? Um, let's think about ways that we can create these networks in our communities. The other thing that I think is really interesting, and I just heard a paper on this last week, um, I was at a conference, you know, virtually at a conference at mm -hmm. University College London, and it was about communal kitchens in Peru mm -hmm. and the ways in which um, many uh, communities that are struggling with food insecurity pool resources together and cook communally and eat communally. Mm. And this is because of the economies of scale, it ends up not only saving women time from the actual cooking and cleaning, but also from mm -hmm. the shopping and the finding of food, which can be mm -hmm. quite scarce, right? Mm -hmm. So so there are wonderful utopian, um, and if we, I mean, and I'm reading a lot of utopian literature these days. There's all <laughs> sorts of really interesting ways that we can think about community kitchens. Uh, we can think about uh, alloparenting institutions or creating networks of friends. And this is not only for parenting, right? Mm -hmm. In our personal lives in the United States, I would say that many of us rely very heavily for emotional support from our romantic partners, mm -hmm. right? Um, women are very good at having friend networks. Men, not as much, right? Mm -hmm. um, we should really think about, you know, ways in which we can expand uh, our kind of friendship kin ties, right? Um, Alexandra Kollontai calls this um, form of, of relationship, she calls it comradely love, which I love the title, right? So, so we, we have um, a, a, a network of, of relationships with lots of people in our societies, colleagues and, and, and neighbors and, and people who go to our, you know, uh, religious institutions or whatever, whom we can kind of count on and rely upon. And, you know, I don't think this is such a strange idea. If you read, you know, Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone, right? In the United States used to have all these Elks clubs and lodges mm -hmm. and, you know, there were all these institute bowling leagues, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all these institutions that allowed for a particular kind of non-kin sociality. And so I think that for women, especially, but for everybody, really, mm -hmm. um, we need to have more robust uh, lateral relationships with our, with our peers. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something, and that are not mediated by the bloody phone <laughs> by the apps, right like just let's like you know go out mm -hmm. sit in a park drink some wine Please. or whatever you know? <laughs> just talk right um it, it's you know I, I think that we need to do more of more of that kind of public just socializing and i think it's going to happen because the spring is coming yeah. and we all need to go out and socialize, socialize out, outdoors, you know? So hopefully yeah. we'll be able to start to think about ways that we can begin to create solidarities, uh, mm -hmm. non-kin solidarities that end up supporting all of us, not only women and children. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, so I have someone here who says, thank you, Dr. Gadzi, for uh, this compelling and important argument about the social ro socialist roots and influence on International Women's Day. As someone teaching a course on everyday communism in Eastern Europe, I value your argument about nuanced approaches to lived experience under state socialism. Your comment about how um, it's not always great, people still felt love. Um, I wonder, however, whether your argument today leaves International Women's Day in a socialist halo when in fact women by the late 80s seemed to many women as a ho hollow holiday um, and many of them envied western beauty products, resented state socialism's failure to provide tampons and other mm. women's uh, needs like that. Um, is your warranted critique of U.S. fail in your warranted critique of U.S. failures have you painted a too rosy picture of women's lives in the eastern bloc? 
Yeah. And I hear that, you know, often. I think that, again, I think the the, the answer to that question is the nuance, right? Is that some, mm -hmm. yeah, a lot of women in the cities wanted beauty products for sure. Uh, there was, there was an economy of shortage. That's a reality. Um, and, you know, Slavenka Draculic wrote about that quite beautifully in um, a book called How We Survived Communism and Even Laughed. Um, but she more recently, by the way, wrote a book called Cafe Europa Revisited, where she sort of goes back and she says, actually, we had it, we women had it pretty good back mm. then. Of course, she's talking about uh, Yugoslavia slash Croatia. Um, but I do think that, that uh, I'm not trying to paint an overly rosy picture. I do think that there were a lot of negatives, and I say so in all of my work. Mm -hmm. There were travel restrictions, and there were consumer shortages, and, and there was the secret police, right? Um, and there were ways in which people's individuality and people's individual autonomy were seriously constrained. That is not something that I'm denying. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that a lot of women in the late 80s, right, uh, and I've done extensive fieldwork in Bulgaria around exactly some of these issues, you know, really thought that the coming of capitalism would mean jeans and lipstick and perfume, mm -hmm. um, and that they wouldn't lose the kindergartens and creches and parental right. leaves and child allowances and public transportation and healthcare and education and all these other things that they took for granted. Right, right. Mm -hmm. Um, so, as I said, I was on a, a call, uh, the DSA did an event on Sunday with um, a Polish woman, a Czech woman, and a Russian woman, um, all who have mothers, right, who, but all of them were born um, before the end of communism, they all have mothers and grandmothers who grew up mm -hmm. under communism, and so, um, and you know, and yeah, there was definitely, you know, it, the, the, the women's emancipation part of it, the, the hollowness of it was that they didn't have the things. They wanted mm -hmm. things, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I can understand that that's very, very frustrating. I'm not belittling that at all. Um, but, you know, what my colleague Katarzyna was saying was that, look, you know, they totally took for granted that you could get a PhD in physics in the Soviet Union as a woman in 1949. They didn't think of that as feminism. Mm -hmm. They didn't think of that as important. And it's mm -hmm. only now, mm -hmm. after the fact, that women are, um, are realizing, like, what they had yeah. And that it was probably a lot better. And, and then the other thing that I'll say, it could, because, because this, is a, this is a really fair critique. Um, mm -hmm. The book has come out, the, you know, the book that I'm talking about is Why Women Have Better Sex Under Socialism. And the book has come out in 13 languages, including five of the former Eastern Bloc. So it's, it's, it's been in Russian, German, Polish, Czech, and Slovak. And, um, and so I've had really interesting reactions from women in the region who read my book in their local languages, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and yeah, I get some women who email me and say, you don't even know what you're talking about, right? It was awful. I hated mm -hmm. living in this. You know, it was just, you know, mm -hmm. I never, I, I, I wanted pretty underwear. I could never get pretty underwear. Mm -hmm. We were just constantly going to Yugoslavia to sneak in, you know, lingerie mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I get as many, if not more, emails from women who say, thank you for saying this. Mm -hmm. Thank you for recognizing how much worse our lives have gotten in the last 30 years. Mm -hmm. Because everything is relative, right? And I don't mm -hmm. want to, I don't want socialism to be under a halo. I think that's mm -hmm. wrong. I think that, you know, most of these societies failed because they had really deep, profound structural problems with them. Mm -hmm. But I do think that they they did some things right around women's rights. And we should be able to get rid of the negative stuff mm -hmm. and keep the positive stuff mm -hmm. and figure out how we're going to live together on this planet for the 21st century. Cause we're facing an entirely different set of constraints and, mm -hmm. and challenges than they were in the 20th century. So we can't possibly use the same political toolkit anyway. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you have time for one more question? Sure. Sure. Okay. It's a little bit long. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> A lot of the early discussion of the woman question in communist circles in the early 20th century focused on the idea of socializing reproductive labor. We know that many socialist countries attempted but never fully completed this particular this political project. During the second wave of feminism in the 60s, reproductive rights took center stage with the right to access contraception and abortion being two of the most notable political advancements in the Western world. Under modern capitalism, however, birth rates are at record lows, in large part due to the financial difficulty of privately bearing the cost of child rearing. Yet much of liberal feminist discourse still focuses on contraception and abortion rights 
as being the defining issues of women's rights? Is it important for us to return to the demand for socializing reproductive labor, um, considering this new social dynamic? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, we, you know, demographers, ha we have all of the empirical evidence we need to show that declining birth rates are the result of A, uh, the, the sheer expense mm -hmm. of raising a child between childcare and, um, and, and college tuition. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's overwhelming when you think about the commitment that is required to, to bring a child into this world for 18 years and, you know, and, and then beyond for, yeah. for university, right? Um, and then there's also the, the world that we live in, which, is, um, which values autonomy and individualism. And, you know, we're all constantly investing in our personal brands and, you know, hashtagging ourselves so that we can raise the value of our labor on a market where the price of, of wages or salaries is determined by supply and demand and children are a hindrance, right? Mm -hmm. So there, there are the opportunity cost of children and then their direct cost of children. And obviously, right, we need to, we need to, um, we need to do two things. We need to support uh, uh, mothers and, and families, you know, not just mothers, but families more broadly speaking, because obviously fathers are really important here too. But rather than just yeah, I think that to the extent that that liberal feminists deal with this question, it's always, well, let's just make men do as much of the labor, uh, you know, take take mm -hmm. half, right? Mm -hmm. As if that will make the labor any less onerous or the expense mm -hmm. any less onerous, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I suppose it's better if two people are doing it instead of one, but it's much better if the society just values it and appreciates it as a whole. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. almost all of my work um, and I, I uh, co-authored an article back in 2012, I believe, with a, a Japanologist named Amy Borovoy, where we were comparing um, what we called social feminist policies, sort of pro-family policies in Japan and in Bulgaria. So two very different economic systems, two very different political systems. But in both systems, you have women uh, who articulate a desire to have families. They think mm -hmm. that, that, that building healthy families and healthy societies is really important. They don't just care about themselves and their individual mm -hmm. autonomy. Mm -hmm. They care about their societies and their families. Mm -hmm. And liberal feminism doesn't really have a place for that. You know, right. if you mm -hmm. care about other people, like you're mm -hmm. just like a victim, you've been brainwashed by patriarchy apparently. And mm -hmm. I just think that that's really short-sighted, right? Mm -hmm. Many women, I mean, I have a daughter. I love my daughter. I, I, there's nothing in the world that I can, you know, that I think of as more wonderful than being a mom, right? Mm -hmm. um, and that, I mean, that was my choice, mm -hmm. but but it would have been so much better if it if it hadn't been so much work for so yeah. long, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I know there's so many parents out there, right, mm -hmm. struggling in the pandemic with their kids at home and schools closed, mm -hmm. and you know, and so much of that labor has been devolving onto the shoulders of mothers, you know, for mm -hmm. all sorts of structural statistical reasons, statistical mm -hmm. discriminate discriminatory reasons. But, you know, I think that, that what women want is not to not have children, but they want help. <laughs> exactly. They want support. Right? Yep. So, so these declining birth rates are, are a symptom of a society and, and I would argue a liberal feminist discourse that devalues mm -hmm. care work. And what mm -hmm. we need to do is not only we don't need to value it by paying for it. We need to value it by socializing it, by mm -hmm. making it easier by by as a society saying to each other this is really important thing that you're doing raising the next generation um, and we're going to do this all together as a society mm -hmm. you know we understand that pensions for the elderly are a good thing right we get it we have medicare for all right if you're 65 you get you get universal health insurance mm -hmm. so why is it that we we're, we, you know, we really protect the elderly, but we completely sell kids down the river, mm -hmm. right? It's mm -hmm. a very odd set of, of discourses in this mm -hmm. country, odd set of contradictions. And I think that yeah. we need, really need to think about changing that for sure. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. This has been wonderful. I've really enjoyed um, your presentation and getting to talk with you. Um, we do have someone asking how they can follow you and your work. Oh God. Okay. So like, I don't really have social media, <laughs> um, uh, I, but yeah, I know. And, and so uh, my website is just kristengodsey.com, one word. Um, and uh, there are links to, you know, all sorts of things there. I do have this podcast. Um, I don't know if you want to type that in the chat to everyone. Um, it's ak47.buzzsprout.com. 
www.thepodcastnetwork.com. Um, it is a, it's, it's a, it's actually a very nerdy little podcast that looks at, um, I read the works of Alexander Kollontai and discuss them. Um, and of course, if you go to my website, all of my books uh, are there and uh, all of links to articles and things like that. Um, I have a newsletter. I just started that newsletter. I think I've done three in the, like the last year. <laughs> so I'm not very good. I'm not as, um, you know, interactive, I guess, as some people. Uh, and I, and I just, the social media thing, you know, I'm, I just sort of missed that boat. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but, but I, I, you know, I, I love, um, hearing from people and uh, there's a contact information on my website. So I really encourage you to um, get involved uh, as politically as you can start a reading group, uh, yeah. you know, do, do go outside um, and somewhere <laughs> you can and, and, and drink with other people. <laughs> Enjoy like the spring. Idea. It's coming. Hopefully this yeah. pandemic will all be over. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just want to let you know that we're getting lots of nice comments from people thanking you for the talk. So um, it's so weird how abrupt it is when we like, I know, <laughs> when I turn it off. So um, again, I just want to thank you so much. I want to thank um, Crease for their co-sponsorship and also Surge and um, KU International Women's Association. Um, and thank you all for coming and for your wonderful questions. And again, thank you so much, Kristen. It's great to, to get to thank talk you. to you. So thank bye, you. Thank you so everybody. much. Yeah. Have, take care. All right. Happy belated International Women's Day, everybody. Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs>